Hi, everyone. Nice to see you again. Well, it's a nice backdrop there. It's a little bright. It's nice. Try to change it up, you know, be in yeah. the, the kitchen lighting. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right. So um, welcome, everyone. Please turn on your cameras for our guest today, if that's at all possible. Um, a little background on our speaker. Um, a, a fellow student, you've heard, you've probably heard this story, a former student graduate applied for a job um, to work with, uh, with Gene at the CBS affiliate um, in Columbus, Georgia, which um, I don't remember the call letters. And if I looked on his page, which I have open, I'd be cheating and I'm just not a cheater. <laughs> and, and Gene and I started talking and honestly, I felt like I knew Gene like, like forever. We were old friends and just great personality and everything. And I guess I sold it because he hired her. And um, based on this, um, and then just seeing some of the videos that Gene has done, which one of which you guys know is on our course website on how to get a job and everything. Um, then um, Gene, Gene works with a lot of young people and he's, you could tell he's very invested in, in career and shaping young people's lives. He's a great resource. And then uh, Gene um, offered up an opportunity for one of our students to do an internship um, online over the summer, over this semester. So it was a great opportunity. And you know, you guys are all looking for internships. So um, I'm looking at my class here and he wanted someone who was getting ready to graduate. And we, um, I recommended Yara. And based on the fact that, um, you know, that Yara had proven herself in a previous class that she had taken with me and, and, and other, speaking to other faculty members, and, um, you know, I just didn't really know too many of you other guys. So it was, you know, and it's turned out great. And it's just been a great relationship. And then I've sat in and just the way Gene is just, just, I guess, so methodical, but in a great way of just really nailing a lot of the points on how to go about getting a job, you know, what they need to do and his willingness to just talk to students um, at any point in time. So like Jeanette and uh, Christina are either uh, former students of mine or current students that just have spoken to him and he gives them the time and everything. And it's just, as you know, you know, uh, Kate always thanks me. She goes, I'm so generous with my time. And if you love what you do, then it's not even, um, you know, it, it's nothing. It's something you love to do. So without any further rambling on from me, I want to introduce to you the news director, the man, the myth, the legend, Gene Kirkconnell. Thank you, Jay. What a, what a wind up, man. <laughs> I'm so glad to be with you all today. And uh, this is a uh, practicum class. And so uh, raise your hand. How many of you all are seniors or recent graduates? So most, most everybody in the club, well, actually everybody on camera is uh, raising their hand. So we've got some folks that um, one thumbs up in the, in the chat there from Yvonne, Ivania. Um, so then uh, most of you guys are in the hunt for a job. Is that correct? Thumbs up if you're in the hunt for a job in media. Okay. Uh, about half of you guys are. Okay. So the, those of you who are not in the hunt uh, for a, a job in media, what is the, the most pressing issue in the forefront in terms of your knowledge or desire uh, for me to relate some information to you here today? Uh, just unmute and tell me real quick, if you don't mind. anybody really like our biggest hesitancy i guess is what you mean yeah any any uh what really want to do want to do is a uh, you know i i hate to sound like a broken record and i've got a a proven presentation about landing a job which is always the most popular thing i do on any college campus so i'm prepared to drill down in that for you guys and then answer questions but i want to make sure i also if there's other stuff that's really burning uh burning up your uh your, uh, your mind here, then I want to cover that. So um, that's why I'm just doing a little quick survey here to make sure I tailor my comments to match what you guys want to want to hear today. Um, well, I mean, I'm probably in like a different situation than most people, like on the short end of the stick or short end or short term, short term after graduation, I'll be working for my brother doing a lot of like, just basically all like the digital and just all the all the PR side of his business because he does cool. everything himself right now. Uh -huh. So it'll let him focus um, on the business side. And then in the long term, I'm working on getting my PGA certification 
um, because I want to work for a PGA Tour, but I have to. Yeah, so I I go all there kind of like um, well, mainly by brand, but I'd like to handle like a lot of content creation for them. Um, So that's what I'm in the process now doing. But obviously, to get PGA certified, you have to hit a bunch of benchmarks. You have to shoot a certain score in front of a PGA coach and stuff like that. So that's Mm -hmm. what I'm working on right now long term. That's That's why I'm not like looking for a media specific job, I guess you would say, yeah. um, cause I'm yeah. short term, I'm short term going to be where I work at a golf shop now. So, yeah. um, I'm pairing up both of those and then while getting better at golf so I can get the PGA certification basically. Cool. Very cool. That's interesting. Yeah. I like the, uh, the marketing side too. Um, so then Jay, is it fair to say that, um, uh, diving in first to the, how to get a job thing is, is the solid way to go or, uh, yeah, I, I think so. Um, okay. The, this class is predominantly, it, it's interesting because when I co-teach with Kate, um, it's typically, we have broadcast media and digital media students. And it's either split down the middle or broadcast media typically has more students. Um, in this particular class, you know, like 90% of the students are, are digital media. Right. So, um, and the, and for the most part, almost everyone is graduating. This is the capstone. So this is the last class. And, and I think um, as, as you've seen, you know, obviously with students I've sent your way or the comments, yeah, just sort of directing them. Um, I think a lot of students also don't really know all the options that are available working in the industry. You know, I mean, so obviously, you know, I mean, the folks we've brought in are typically work news related, you know, or entertainment related. So, yeah. So, I mean, it's just maybe to enlighten them and kind of get them going on what you think, you know, is their best path right now. Sounds great. So I'll I'll be a little bit more general then, and I'll answer specific questions to each one of you as you you help me drill down on what you really want to get out of it. I really want everybody on the call to at least at the end of the call, I'm going to ask a question. Did everyone on the call get at least one actionable takeaway that they can use moving forward? And my goal would be to have everybody whose video is on, give me a thumbs up like that. So really, if I don't cover it, I really want you to interrupt me and say, hey, I'm really curious about X, Y, and Z. Tell me how to do that or give me some advice on that. I really want to uh, make sure you have something in your hand that you can take action on when we break today. So I appreciate you guys having me in and welcome me in to chat with you guys. I have a, I'll give you just a Cliff Notes version myself. I started off in media when I was uh, a, a paper boy. You know, I used to actually have a paper route when people read the newspaper on printed paper and I would ride around the neighborhood and throw the papers in people's yard. And I started reading those news stories and realizing, oh, people actually make a living telling stories and putting them in the paper. So I started, that started my interest in reading and writing uh, news stuff. I'd always been an avid reader and still am. And then I started a a, a newspaper at my high school when I was in high school because we didn't have one. And that got the attention of the local newspaper where I freelanced all the way through high school and college. And I also got a job at a radio station in high school. And then I've worked in print and radio for wire services as a freelancer for sporting events and television um, in PR and advertising. So I've really used my storytelling skills and my writing ability to make my way predominantly in journalism, but also in some marketing and sales um, venues uh, and in every format, TV, digital, print, and, uh, and advertising over the course of my career. So the good news for you guys is if you've trained and done your coursework, in how to tell stories and how to write and how to create uh, the engaging content, then there's never been a better time in the the history of humanity to have those skills and rest easy about being able to find a job and make a living creating content. So that's the good news. Even, Even more piled on top of that is when I started coming up through the industry, I had to go to a business that had capital, that had equipment, that had an audience to serve and or subscribers. And I had to ask them, can I work for you so that I can ply my my trade as a storyteller in order to make a living? Now, you guys do not need me. You don't need a newspaper. You don't need a radio station because social media and digital media uh, and all of the uh, various platforms that are available now to all of us, and we all 
consume provide for monetization so that you can actually make a living by creating content and you don't need me to give you a job to do that. That's a really exciting thing. And it comes in the form of some of you all are from, you know, follow people on, I'll pick YouTube as an example. And I've told this story before and I apologize if any of you have heard it previously, but I'll tell the story of a, uh, a couple of young people from right here in Columbus they all attended Columbus State University. And Columbus State University is not known as a big journalism school or a big media school. It is a school that um, is solid and has some good programs and, and a, a lot of young people from here go there. But one thing they do have, they have two professors there that teach a particular course in new media. And it really, the backbone of that course is simply get in the course, launch a YouTube channel, and by the end of the semester, you have to have 100 subscribers. Do whatever it takes to get 100 subscribers. That's the goal of that course. Now, during the course of that, um, uh, that semester, they get you under the hood. They teach you about metrics, YouTube metrics um, and uh, Google Analytics and all kinds of different uh, parameters by which you can judge, is my outreach, is my content, is my material connecting with an audience and eventually if I keep doing this, can I grow that and can I turn it into something either as a platform for my voice and or as a platform for monetization. Um, and there have been, I jokingly refer to that class with the uh, instructors and the administrators down there as the millionaire maker class because there are three people that have come out of that single course in the last two year, two and a half years who are now multimillionaires from the revenue they generate on YouTube. One of them, and I'll tell the story about him, Jake, uh, you may or may not be aware of him, uh, his content on YouTube, he's a treasure hunter. So he started off with a gaming channel in the class. It did not take off. He's by, uh, by hobby, uh, a, a surfer. So his story is his parents, military family lived in the West Coast he was surfing, spending more time surfing than he was going to class at his college out there. Didn't do well in his courses. His mom and dad retired from the military, moved back to Columbus. We have a big military community here. And he stayed on the West Coast surfing. And finally, they said, look, we're not paying for your college if you're not going to go to class and we're not going to pay your bills. So you can come here and live with us if you go to Columbus State. He came, moved here, went to Columbus State, took that course. But also the Chattahoochee River runs through downtown Columbus and has a whitewater rafting course. There's a there's a rapid in the course called the Wave Shaper, and it's a perpetual wave. So all the surfers go down there and ride this wave for hours on end. Well, when the when the um, tide goes down or the flow of the river goes down there, uh, it's it's very calm. And so Jake noticed that the river rafters would come down the river, flip over. And then they would complain, I lost my phone, I lost my sunglasses, I lost my wallet, you know, I lost my watch, lost my GoPro. So he'd go snorkeling in the river with a GoPro on his uh, mask and he would videotape finding the material in the river. He goes by the, the, the name uh, D Almighty, D-A-L-M-Y-D, D Almighty. And I don't know, I mean, I'll pull it up real quick on YouTube, uh, tread water here but I'll search Jake's channel. So Jake is, so just you know, not, not to, uh, uh, let's see. So he right now has 11.9 million subscribers. Uh, Jake has 11.9 million subscribers. And now instead of looking for stuff in the Chattahoochee River, he flies all over the world and treasure hunts. That's his thing. And he has made a business out of one course and, uh, Y'all are at the tail end of your experience, but Jake didn't even bother finishing CSU. He treated it seriously. He really went all in as a business and he totally killed it. And now he's just making a living off of YouTube. I mean, you know, two years ago when I last had a conversation with him, because we did a story about him because he found a, a, a gun in the river and turned it over to police. It wound up being connected to a crime. And um, at that time, uh, he had already signed multiple endorsement deals. Chevy had given him a truck, you know, and regularly three or four times a year, he would feature the truck in a video and get paid, you know, $15,000 for featuring the truck in a single video on his channel. Um, 
uh, all the gear he uses is scuba gear. It's all given to him and he gets paid to wear it in his videos. So product placement out, out the, like you wouldn't believe it. And this was two and a half years ago. He had just begun to take off. He's probably at least doubled, if not tripled his subscribers since then. At that time, he was clearing um, probably in the range of 40K in recurring advertising revenue every month on his YouTube channel, just from the advertising revenue. And he would regularly bring in as much in sponsorship deals. So you're talking about a person who was making 80 to $100,000 a month in a business he created, creating and distributing content. He is not any smarter than anybody else in this class in front of us right now. He's a really good storyteller and he, he grinds and he goes after it. And he went all in on this content distribution and the something he loved and cared about. And he is set for life. You know, I'm, I'm not sure if he's blowing all his money. I don't think so, but, <laughs> but he's making a living. He's making a living out of creating content. And, and, you know, uh, that is tends to be admired, you know, just incredible. There's two other people who were going to school at the same time, Jake, and they've done the same thing. One of them also does kind of uh, fishing related stuff and, and uh, outdoors kind of related stuff. And a, and a third person, um, this would have been two and a half years ago too. I had an intern in my class just like a spring semester two years ago. And he knew this woman and uh, was a friend of hers, chatted with her. And the very day that he chatted with her, she was probably a year into it at that point. So she had invested a year in her channel. The, uh, two years ago, she was up to that week um, on her channel, she was up to $20,000 a month in recurring revenue from advertising on a YouTube channel. And she, that week alone that he talked to her, signed three sponsorship deals, 15K a piece. One was with Tyson vacuum to feature the vacuum in one video for $15,000. And she signed two other sponsorship deals, also 15K a piece. So in that single month, she made 20K in recurring revenue plus 45K in sponsorship deals. So I don't mean to say this to put stars in your eyes and a lot of people see quote YouTube millionaires and they think, oh, they make a video, do something dumb and a viral video takes off and then they make a bunch of money. That's not it. You have to have hit after hit after hit after hit. You have to approach it as a business. You have to market it. You have to create great content and connect. The reason I'm telling you this is just to reinforce what I just said to you. If you have something you're deeply passionate about and you've learned the skills you've learned, at school and you've repped it in internships and or freelancing and or on your own to get even better every day or trying to trying to get a little bit better at storytelling or marketing or video creation or writing if you do that and you find an outlet where you can connect with other people who are passionate about a similar thing those people will come to you and give you money for your content and for products related to your content it's not rocket science but again, some people, it happens overnight. There are three or four stories I've heard of people hitting it in a week going from zero subscribers to a million subscribers. That's extremely rare. But, and there's a bunch of people also in that class I told you about who they don't, they're not making millions like Jake, but they're making, you know, they're making a couple hundred dollars a month. So they're paying for their books. They're paying for their rent. You know, they got beer money. So, I mean, you know, you don't have to strike it rich to be a success in creating content. So the, the, the whole point I'm really trying to make to you is there are so many different platforms that where if you're a solid storyteller and you find an audience that wants your stuff, you can make money. Some people can make an, make a living off of it and it creates a ton of freedom for you to be able to dictate, well, this is the kind of work I want to be doing. This is how I want to be doing it. These are, this is the audience I want to serve. And, you know, I can make my own hours. You know, it's not a cruise thing where you just lay back and the money rolls in. You got to work hard. Jake works hard. And those other folks I mentioned work hard. But I just say that to you because if you're on the eve of, you know, getting into a, a business, a, a marketing business, a, you know, digital content, a television station, a website, a, uh, a TV station, I read though all those things are fantastic because they can help you learn to be a stronger storyteller and content creator. 
but there is there's a big whole fantastic world out there with a ton of opportunity in it and if you're willing to combine your content creation skills with hustle and entrepreneurship and some uh marketing and salesmanship you can make a really nice living for yourself and you know I mean, what is it? A year ago, TikTok didn't even exist. And now there's a bunch of people making money off TikTok too. So you think, oh, they figured it out. There's Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn. And that's pretty much it. Well, then along comes TikTok. And, you know, there's probably going to be another one next year. So <laughs> you can you can make money off and, and, and earn a good living in a, in a traditional setting of a corporation uh, or as an entrepreneur. So uh, feel good about that. I know if you're on the eve of graduation, one of the biggest things you're worried about is, oh my goodness, can I get a job and am I gonna be able to pay my bills and pay off my student loan? That's 99% that's of everybody in your shoes right now is concerned about that. Uh, I would say relax if you are gonna take what you've learned in school and your experiences so far out in the world, you can land a gig, you can get started. Just remember your first gig out of your, your job right now is not to get the perfect you know, end of the rainbow job coming out of school. Your job is to get started. It's to break in. So find a place where you can break in and where you think it's going to be a stepping stone to something else. It's a place where you can level up. You know, Amanda Peralta is the young, the young person that I hired from FIU uh, to come work with us here. And she's doing a really good job. Um, she did a story a couple weeks ago about a guy who'd been in prison, prison for 40 years, un wrongly convicted of rape and was let out of prison after four decades in prison. Killer story. She did a really good job on it. And so that's two months into the business. I mean, that, that's, that's ahead of the curve in my book, you know. Um, and she's repping it every day, cranking out content, learning to be a better writer, learning to be a better visual storyteller. So... Um, much of what uh, I'm going to share my, I think I can share my screen, right, Jay? Let me, let me try it. Yes, yeah. I, I did want to tell you the story she just did with the two, the box, the sisters doing the boxing. Yeah. As far as her on-camera persona, it would, to me, it was leaps and bounds above the other stuff. You know, I mean, it might not have had the meat that the, the other story did, but she, and especially her clothes, her clothing stand-up looked really good. You know, it was just um, big improvement. Yeah. That was a really solid effort, yeah, on her part. And that was a fun story to watch too. But yeah, I'll go through some of these slides, and please, y'all, interrupt me and stop me uh, if if uh, this is boring to you, if it's not hitting what you want to learn. This is the system I recommend to all uh, pending graduates that they employ, and this is a system which will allow you to apply for 100 jobs in the next 30 days. So if and, and I, I'm not joking when I give you that number. I, I really do recommend that you apply for at least 100 jobs um, if you want to get an offer, more than one offer, before you graduate um, in May. And so in order to do that, you got to get organized, right? So how do you do that? The system I recommend has been honed over years of talking to thousands of people like you, getting feedback from you guys, and, and honestly, probably interviewing 10,000 you know, applicants over the course of my career and figuring out what I like and what other news directors like and what just breaks through the clutter and, and uh, gets you noticed. So the system that I recommend to you is to organize, search, research, evaluate, apply, email, call, and follow up. So those are the components and I'll break them down for you. So you get organized. The first thing you need to do um, is fix your resume. So your resume, it should be one page and it should have four sections in it. The top section of your resume should include the following items, your name, a cell phone number where you can be reached for an interview by a hiring manager, an email address, which you check regularly. I can't tell you how frustrating it is to see an applicant apply to me and I get excited about them and I send them an email and don't even email me back for two weeks. I might have filled the job by then. You have got to be checking your email at the very least once a day, probably two or three times a day. Secondly, I would recommend that you get an email address, which is, if you can, make it your name. Try to own your name. So try to own yaratrosh at gmail.com. You know, try to own 
Chad Mirage, I hope I pronounced that correctly, at gmail.com. Own your name, right? Because if I get a name uh, that says, you know, YTRO849ZX at dot FIU dot EDU, then I'm not going to remember that's Yara. I, 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 but if I see Yara Trosh at gmail.com, I'm like, that's Yara. I like to reel. I'm going to call her, right? So you want to establish a Gmail account when if you want, if you can possibly own your name. If you're not able to own your name, um, if uh, Megan Nunez is already taken at gmail.com, then do Megan Nunez TV at gmail.com or do Nunez TV or do Megan Nunez Media at gmail.com. Something that includes your name and that you can own on Gmail. Thereafter, go to all your social media accounts. Um, if you if you don't have social media accounts that already have tons of subscribers and are already or about to generate revenue for you with whatever you're doing with them, if you just have accounts you're having fun with, my recommendation is immediately go to those accounts and standardize them in their handles and their branding with your name. The One of the greatest assets you can have is to own your name on every platform. So own your name on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, um, uh, TikTok, and if you can, uh, I, I was recommending Twitter. I mean, excuse me, uh, a Twitch, but uh, Twitch may be spiraling into a into a death spiral right now because YouTube uh, uh, gaming is coming on pretty strong. If you haven't established a presence on Twitch, it's pretty hard to establish a presence and make money off of it. But the core ones are LinkedIn. You got that's like a like a digital resume. You got to have a presence on LinkedIn. Make sure it's up to date. A Facebook page, not a profile where you have friends, but a page where you can look at and see who's following your content. And um, you can uh, present a professional sort of um, personality storefront on a YouTube page. I mean, a, 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 a Facebook page, not a profile. Um, YouTube is crucial because all your all your portfolio video has got to be put somewhere. Do not ask a hiring manager to download a video that you shot to look at your work. They're not going to do it. You may it may have a Chinese virus attached to it that's going to infect their computer, or their company may not allow them to do it. Don't make them go to a Dropbox and click on a video. Park your video on YouTube because it's ubiquitous, it's safe, it's easy to find, everybody knows how to use it. And frankly, somebody might come across your video you haven't applied to and like it and try to contact you to hire you for a freelance gig or for a job. Um, so again, uh, link Gmail, get a Gmail address, you check two times a day, preferably own your name, standardize your professional branding across Gmail, um, YouTube, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook page, Twitter, and Instagram. So those core accounts. Gene, can I butt in for a second here? You talk about, um, this just happened last week. You talk about people coming across your videos and stuff like that. There's a camera these guys used to shoot with. It's the Canon XA11, I think it's called. And um, I have we, um, we did a video on how to use the equipment, you know, because usually our equipment room guys come in and do that but I had them cut a video I put on the YouTube channel. I got an email last week from a professor from Memphis who wanted to know why I chose this camera. And he was thinking of getting one to do some videos and stuff like that. And boy, I've been on YouTube, you know, since like day one. And I think this is the first time that's ever happened. It was just really kind of cool that somebody just, um, you know, came across that. Yeah, that's awesome. That's, that's good stuff. There's somebody out there that wants that content, you know, no matter what it is. <clears throat> so, so get it, get it, get an email address that is not your school email address. Preferably it is your name. It's easy to remember. Um, and it's on Gmail and then standardize that brand across all uh, platforms. I'm going to actually take you right now. There's, there's the almighty's YouTube channel. Well, no, let me, let me, oh, Sorry, I'm, uh, I didn't share that yet. I'm going to share it so y'all can see it. Uh, let's see. Uh, so that's 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 the Almighty right there. That's his YouTube channel. See, 11.9 million subscribers. There's Jake. That's that's uh, that's the Chattahoochee River right there. So, 
So let me go uh, pull up a, uh, a different, I'll pull up my uh, LinkedIn channel. Y'all can see my LinkedIn pop, popping up right now, right? Give me a thumbs up. So here's my, here's my profile. And the reason I'm showing this to you is because you see at the top there, it's red, white, and blue. That graphic, it looks kind of like a flag with, uh, with that, that uh, the typewriter-like font, ITG, I trust Gene. I, I, I grabbed I trust Gene as a handle on all the platforms because my name, you see Kirk Connell, every time I'd speak on campus, I'd go to a classroom and I'd write my name on the board, G Kirk Connell at WRBL.com and, and people would misspell it. Even though I wrote it up there, it's, it is a mouthful, right? And so all of the professors that would introduce me, uh, in fact, one week when I went on a campus tour, I had three professors on three separate campuses during the course of that week say the same thing. I used to work for Gene, um, I trust him and you should trust Gene. So if he tells you to do something, do it. And so I said, well, that's what I'm going to grab because it's easy to remember. I started using it a couple of years ago, but that's what I, I, what I've done is then standardize all my channels, all my social channels that I recommend you do. Right. So there's my, uh, there's my LinkedIn. Let's go to Facebook now and show you what my Facebook looks like. That's my, actually, that's my personal Facebook for friends and family. Let me go to uh, Facebook, uh, my professional Facebook page. There you go. So if you go to my Facebook page, you see it's got the same artwork on it. So standardize your name, own your name on every platform and standardize the look and aesthetic of everything on all of your social platforms. So no matter what I see in reference to you on any platform, I, I am reminded, oh yeah, she uses uh, pink and green with a bold white font and and that's her name and i see that it looks the same on every platform so i'm reassured and comforted as i go around to find your content that yes that is the same person uh whom i'm looking for so that is uh important to do so once once you've done that you've established uh your your you own your gmail uh you've established your uh, account on uh uh, your standard branding across all those accounts, and then you're going to fix your resume. And your resume, again, let's, uh, I'll, I'll redo that for you. One page, four sections, top section, contact information, name, phone number you can be reached at, email address you check regularly, and a, if you're, especially if you're going for an, uh, a reporter position or a journalism position, and an active link to your YouTube resume reel if you're a reporter or an anchor or an active link to your portfolio if you're another kind of creator so i can see work that you do so the top section is contact information name phone number email you check and a link to your portfolio the middle section is experience most students coming out of school the next thing they put is their school stuff don't do that put your experience next format your resume like a person who's already in a job somewhere working. So whatever experience you have, put it in the next section. The third section is your school experience. So Florida International University, May 2021 graduate, major in you know media studies, uh, you know dean's list, whatever you can put there, right there. One of the reasons you put your school information there is because if you're in school now and it's March and you're applying for a job, you want to let that hiring manager know when you are available to begin work. So if you graduate in May, you will be available to take a position when you graduate in May. And then the final section of your resume is other. It's anything cool about you, an experience, a skill, something like that, that you have that you want to make sure that a hiring manager knows. And that's really it. So how do I reach you? How do I see your work? Where have you worked before? When are you available for work? Where'd you, where, you know, where'd you graduate from school? And something else cool or different or unique. And I, I'm probably an old fuddy-duddy, but one thing I always put on my resume in the other section is I'm an Eagle Scout. I was in Boy Scouts. And making Eagle is not an easy thing to do. Um, and so I've actually had interviewers call me and say, hey, I was an Eagle Scout. You know, let, let's talk. Or, you know, my son's an Eagle Scout. Let, let's talk. And so it's actually gotten me interviews before. So that's just one little thing I put in there. And I usually in that section, I've, I've won some awards in media. I, that's where I put my awards down there at the bottom of that. So you've standardized your resume to one page. Now take your perfected resume with no spelling errors, with all the dates correct, format it as I just described to you, and then 
open up your LinkedIn profile and make your LinkedIn profile perfectly match your resume. So there's no discrepancies between your hard copy of your resume and your LinkedIn profile. They are one in the same in terms of data, right? There's no discrepancies. And then you're going to then take that information. There's all the information from your resume. You're, matching, you're mat matching it to your, your, uh, your LinkedIn profile. And you're going to take all that information that's on your resume and set up your profile on all the job sites. Monster, Glassdoor, um, uh, all the other, all the Indeed, right? But then specifically in media, you're going to go to the media company's career websites. You're going to law, you're going to create a profile. Every media company, every corporation has a standard uh, entry point where you create a profile. And once your profile is created, you begin applying for jobs. So you want the profile you create on each one of these sites to perfectly match your resume and your LinkedIn profile. So all of the data matches up, right? Once you establish that, that and I'm going to show you a career site and show you how easy it is. So this is the next star career website. This is my company right here. So this is what it looks like. Here's some beautiful looking people who anchor the news in Chicago. And then down here, find your next star career. What you'll do is you'll find your next star career. And here's all the job listings. I are, you know, I'm not going to set up a, uh, a profile here, but if you click on sign in, it'll prompt you to sign in or, or create a profile. This is where you create a profile. So let's assume you've done that and all of your profile information perfectly matches your LinkedIn profile and your resume. Then you're in the system and you say, I'm going to apply for jobs. So you search, I want to be a reporter. You search reporter, you click on search, and right now there are 187 reporter jobs available in my company. And then you just click on it, click on that. This one's in Baton Rouge and see that apply. Boom. So you literally, once you set up, so remember I told you, you need to be applying for a, at least 100 jobs in the next 30 days. So you'll have several offers before you graduate. You thought, oh my God, how am I going to do that? That's going to be really time consuming. If you perfect your resume, make it match your LinkedIn profile, set up the same information on all these corporation websites. I literally could go through here and probably in three and a half minutes, apply for 40 jobs that quick. Click, apply, submit, click, apply, submit, click, apply, submit. It's that fast. This is just one corporate site. So if I apply for 25 jobs here, that's 25 of 100. I go to three more media company sites. I hit apply on 25 jobs. Boom. I've hit my 100 number. Does that make sense? So it's not as hard as you think, but getting the numbers up are very important. It is a numbers game. You must apply for a bunch of jobs in order to be able to secure an offer. So you've done that, you set up your profile and you're, you, you're beginning to apply, right? You got to keep organized. If you apply for a hundred jobs and you don't keep it organized and know what you're doing, you're, you're going to be lost and you're going to forget, honestly, probably by tomorrow, which jobs you applied for. You're not going to remember that. My recommendation is, go analog get don't don't try to save the notes about all those jobs you applied for on your phone right because if you have notes about a job you've applied for on your phone and then a hiring manager from that application calls you you're going to be talking to that person how are you going to reference your notes about the job you've applied for so i recommend getting a paper binder Three, roll, three, three on a ring binder, one piece of paper for every job for which you apply. At the top of that piece of paper, write the position, reporter, city, Baton Rouge, call letters, WLTV, ownership, Next Star Inc., right? News director, Joe Spada, 
And today, the 23rd of uh, March, 2021, talked to Joe. Joe said he'd be filling the position in 45 days. Call him back in two weeks. Make sure to call Joe back on April the 11th, 2021. I made a note so I know when I go, I know what to do next. I know what my next step is. You keep a log of every contact you have with that, um, that job or that person, and it keeps you organized and it prevents you from getting lost. You may investigate a job, you may do an interview, and you may decide that's not for me. You just take that piece of paper out of the binder, move it to the back of the binder. It's a cold, it's a cold lead now. You don't need to keep pursuing that. And you just work your way through all 100 of those, and then you refresh yourself on those sites. You apply for 100 jobs, you cycle through them, and you keep monitoring the sites. You maybe, as you go through, apply for another 20. Does that make sense about analog and paper and how to keep track of all these jobs for which you've applied? Okay, so before you actually you know, hit apply, you wanna dig around in those corporate websites and you want to, if you see something that's super interesting, you wanna maybe go to that station's website, read a few of their stories um, and you wanna research and if you start to get really excited about a position, think, yeah, that's the one for me. You've applied for a hundred, maybe there's 20 of them that are like right at the top. You're like, that's kind of in my sweet spot. I think I might be able to get those jobs. They're in cool places I might wanna live. They are with stable companies. You know, I actually, two of those 10 jobs, I have friends from South Florida who are actually already working in those stations. So I've got some leads in there that could, they could talk me up. So maybe you got 20 jobs that are super hot. You dig a little deeper and research those companies, stations and cities. So you understand a little bit more about the opportunity, where it's located, the company that um, is running that and something about that operation. Um, one way you can also uh, research a station besides just going on their websites is call into the newsroom, you know, or call into that operation. If you know that it's kind of a quiet time um, around eight o'clock local time, you know, 830 local time, it's after the six o'clock news, it's before the 11 o'clock and it's not so close to the 11 o'clock where the producer's too busy to talk to you. So you call into the newsroom around 1130, the news director may or may not be there at that time of night. You might get a, a newscast producer and just be honest with them. Say, look, you know, my name's Steve. I'm applying to your station for an MMJ job. And how's it how's it to work there? You, can you just give me, you know, two or three minutes to just tell me a little bit about what's it like to work there? You know, tell me a little bit about what what happens to the, the, the MMJs that come to work there. Do they get to move up? Do they learn a lot? You know, pick somebody's brain who might be closer to you. You know, a news director, maybe he's been in the business 20 years that night side producer might be in the business two or three years. So they remember what it was like to be in your shoes trying to break into the business. So pick their brain. Once you gather all your information, then you evaluate and maybe, you know, you decide, well, those 20 jobs are not for me. You don't actually apply for them. You get your list of, you know, sol a solid 20 or 30, and then the other ones that are very similar, and you apply for those 100 jobs after you evaluate them potentially. One thing I would also encourage you to evaluate is, and, and the question you need to be answering for yourself is, as I look at a job, and it's all imperfect information, you can't know everything about a position, but you need to ask yourself, from what I see in the job description, from what I've learned in my research, um, it appears that I would be uh, interested in that job, successful at that job, um, and would like that job. You have to answer this question. If the hiring manager offers me that job, will I accept it? If you can't say yes to that, don't apply. Don't waste your time. Don't waste their time. One thing you may be weighing is, am I willing to go to Bismarck, North Dakota and spend most of my year in ice and snow in order to break into this business or to get this job? I see your face, Ivanya. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. If you if you answer no to that question because you're just not a cold weather person, that is totally cool. So don't bother applying to Idaho, North Dakota, very, very far north Minnesota, Wisconsin, because if you don't like snow and you're not going to be happy there and it's too far away from family, then don't waste your time and don't waste their time applying for that job. Um, 
evaluate not only what the job might have to offer, but what you're willing to do and how far you're willing to go. The caveat on, on that is not all of you, if you are trying to break into a TV station, not all of you are going to be able to land a gig in the next 60 days um, at, a, at an Orlando, Tampa, or Miami television station. You know, it's you may have to consider going somewhere else, moving to South Carolina, moving to Georgia, moving to Texas, moving to Virginia. You know, moving the the law, the farther away you're considering and willing to move, the greater number of jobs you can contend for. That's a reality, especially of our business. So again, I recommend you apply for 100 jobs by the end. This is I told this to interns back in February. Um, it's already March. Um, if you can get it done by the end of March, but certainly the end the next 30 days, apply for 100 jobs on the job sites like Indeed on career sites, um, and then um, enter notes on your piece of paper for each one of these jobs so you can remember certain things about them. Right. So you you find those jobs, you apply for them, and then you cannot just apply and sit and wait for someone to call you. You must follow up. Right. So you need to um, remember when you're applying, you don't need a cover letter. Um, a lot of a lot of uh, 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 you know, people think you have to write a cover letter um, unless you're applying to someplace like, you know, very corporate and stodgy. I don't know. I'm just going to name an IBM and that may be unfair, um, but a, a corporate a bank or something like that. If they tell you to write a cover letter, write a cover letter. Um, but for a TV station, you don't need a cover letter. You need your resume again that's been perfected and consider the email that you send to a hiring manager that's your cover letter and it doesn't have to be you know i started watching tv when i was three years old and i used to sing along the cartoons and that made me want to be on tv and then i wanted to be a news anchor i don't need to hear that later on when we talk i'd be glad to hear that story but i just need to i need to have a couple of very very specific things here's my name Here's the job I've applied for. Here's why I think it'd be a good match. What's my next step? Three or four sentences. That is it. You need to reference the station and call letters. You need to get the hiring manager's name and title correct and spelling. Do not send an email to follow up to a newsroom and a, and a news director or a hiring manager and write to, to whom it may concern. You will not be hired. You need to know who the hiring manager is, spell their name correctly, get their title correct, and send it to the correct person. That requires maybe a phone call or an email or a Google search on the website. Um, and mention one skill that matches the position. That's your cover letter. Your email is your cover letter. Three sentences, specific references, get the hiring manager's name and title correct, and, and get in one little nugget about why you're a rock star and are a good match for that position. So you've applied, and you're, you need to follow up. Right. You cannot sit there and wait for a phone call. It happens, sadly, many, many times. I go to campus pre COVID. I go to campus in November. I speak to a class and I meet somebody named um, uh, Joseph. Right. And Joseph uh, tells me about himself and he wants to be a reporter at a TV station. And I give Joseph some advice and I tell him the same things I'm telling you. And then I go back to campus two months later in February. And I speak and Joseph shows up at a student media meeting um, and, he, and I say, yeah, I remember you, Joseph. Tell me a little bit how you doing, what you've been doing since we last talked. And I tell him the same stuff again. Right. And then invariably, there's always one or two people 18 months later, the summer after they graduate. I saw him in February of 2019 and um, and then June of 2020. Joseph sends me an email and, I, and Joseph tells me I still don't have a job. He's been out of school for 15 months and he still didn't have a job. And I say, Joseph, how many jobs have you applied for? And Joseph says five jobs. I said, what I tell you, your the fall of your senior year, he said, apply for 100 jobs. And then what did I tell you again, the spring of your senior year, apply for 100 jobs. What am I going to tell you now? Apply for 100 jobs. If you apply for five jobs, you may not get any offers. It's a numbers game. And you need to apply for those jobs, but you can't stop there. You can't apply for the jobs and wait to be called. You got to get around the robots on the website, right? The way to do that is to make a direct contact with a hiring manager. So you do it by emailing first and phone calling second, and then following up. Record all of those contacts in your binder that we talked about. 
So let's say you've got your 20 hottest jobs in the top of your binder. You've got the contact information. You've done your research. You're really excited about those gigs. So you say on Tuesday, on, on, uh, on Wednesday, um, March the 24th, I'm going to make six phone calls between 930 and 1130 local time at all at, at my six favorite jobs. And you, you, you got the names and the numbers and the call letters and you've, you've prepped yourself and you got just your research ready, right? And so you send that email I talked about the morning that you're going to make the phone call. You send an email with your re resume attached and those just three, three to five sentences in it telling about who you are, right? And then you make the call, right? You repeat this process. Let's say you get the hiring manager on the call, right? This is your first contact. This is a cold call. Um, and you need to handle this call in a very specific way. So I'm going to give you the exact script to say when you get a news director or a hiring manager on the phone call phone for the very first time, especially if it's a cold call. This is what you say. This will be specific to a newsroom and a television station, but you can adapt it to any job you apply for at any company doing any job, right? So here's how it goes. Ring, 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 ring. Hi, Stan Johnson here, news director. Hi, Stan. My name is Steve Smith. I've applied for the digital MMJ job on your corporate website. In fact, I've also sent you my resume. It should be in your inbox right now. I want to be respectful of your time. So this phone call will take less than 90 seconds. Is that okay? That is a key phrase because as soon as you say your name and say, I'm interested in a job, the first thing that pops into a hiring manager's mind is, how do I get this person off the phone? I have a busy day. I don't have time to talk to random job candidates, but if you say, I want to be respectful of your time, so this call will take less than 90 seconds, is that okay? If you say that nine times out of 10, they're going to say, sure. They will give you 90 seconds. You have just landed your first interview. Now you have probably 75 seconds left to get in the rest of your spiel, right? And what you're going to try to get in is your elevator pitch. Does everybody know what an elevator pitch is? It's okay. So an elevator pitch is from you get on an elevator in a building. By chance, you meet somebody that works at the company where you want to work and you got 30 seconds, 45 seconds before they get to the floor of their business to tell them how great you are and why you'd be a good hire, right? So you've just been given permission by the hiring manager to proceed. So you then proceed. Thank them. Really appreciate it. I'm interested in the blah, blah, blah job, the, the reporter job at your station, um, because I've done some research and I see you guys do a lot of stories about military coverage. I'm from a military family. I've covered military issues for my school newspaper and I freelance for um, Navy Times as well. And um, so uh, I've had a lot of experience doing that. Uh, that's just one of the reasons why I think I'd be a really good match for this particular uh, um, position. I also know that Columbus, Georgia is really famous for the whitewater rafting in your downtown area. I, in fact, am a world-class Olympic gold medalist in whitewater rafting. So I've been to Columbus four times for competitions. I love the city and the chance to work there would just be awesome. So that's probably taken me 22, 23 seconds, right? And I've said something, I've, I've proven, I've researched your station, I've researched the position, I've researched your town, and I've just given you two reasons why I'd be a good hire, because I can do, I can already do and have done the kind of work you guys are doing. And outside of work, I'm a pretty cool person and I'm easy to get along with. And I kind of, I like where you guys are from as well. So I've given you two nuggets of, to make you feel good about advancing the conversation with me, right? And you can adapt those 
bits of information to a station, a town, a company, a particular position, the kind of way the job is described. But you're trying to just prove you've researched the station and the job and the town and the company. And you're trying to just offer up without a hard sell a couple of reasons why you're already doing work and already have some experience, which makes you a good match for that position. Does that make sense? It's casual. You're not needy. You're not begging. You're not trying to prove, you know, uh, anything. It's just, I know what you guys are about. I like what you guys are about. It excites me greatly. I think I'd really click with you guys. That, that, that kind of like, I don't really, and, and I, I say this out loud and you don't ever want to say this out loud to a hiring manager, but I say it out loud for you. It's almost like your attitude is like, I know I'm good. I could kill it. If you hired me, you need to hire me. And you know what? Honestly, I don't need your job because I can get a job somewhere else. You don't want to be cocky, but you don't want to sound desperate and needy. Does that make sense the way I'm describing that for you guys? So not being too casual, being respectful, number one, but don't be needy, you know, be confident, be, be, be breezy. And, and, but if you, if you have your research down and your, and your specifics down, it's easy to feel confident because you know what the job's about, you know what the town's about, you know what the company and station's about, and you're, and you've already thought, you know, and you've, you've told yourself, uh, this could be cool. If I get this job, this would be fun. I could get to do some good work. So that's the kind of tone you want to be striking, right? So it's ring, ring. Hi, I'm Steve Smith. I'm applied for the digital MMJ job at your TV station. Uh, I've already applied on the corporate website and I went ahead and emailed you my resume. It's in your inbox right now. Uh, it's probably right at the top of the queue there. I sent it, I sent it this morning. I do want to be respectful of your time. So this call will take less than 90 seconds. Is that okay? Sure, go ahead. Research your station. I like the kind of work you guys are doing specifically X, Y, and Z. I've actually done some of that kind of work before. I love it. In fact, I won a student journalism award for it last semester, um, a student Emmy award. That's on my resume reel, which you can get an active link to on the, my email that I sent to you and my resume. And your town's pretty cool too. You know, I play softball. I played a bunch of softball tournaments in Columbus. So I know you guys have a fun town and it's a great place to live, especially for young people starting out in the business like me. Um, love, to, love to learn this way you transition to the last part of the conversation. I'd love to learn more about the position, exactly what you're looking for. Um, and I'd be happy to set up a time uh, when it's more convenient for you to talk at length. Or if you'd like to ask me a couple of questions right now, I'm, I'm prepared to chat briefly. Open the door for them to ask you a couple of questions to continue the conversation. You know, that's down there at the bottom, the third line from the bottom on this slide. Chat later, or you can ask me some questions now. If I, if someone does that with me, and the, the amazing thing about this, I've given this presentation so many times in so many different places in person and online, I have candidates call me and use my script on me. And I love it. I just wait for them to, to give me the punchlines and then I respond. I reward them, <laughs> you know, and if I can, if I've got, I'll tell them, well, let me hold on. Let me check my calendar. I have seven minutes before my next meeting. You get five of them. Let's go. First question. Tell me why, blah, 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 blah. And I'll ask him a question. You know, if it goes quickly, I'll ask him one more and I'll say, then I'll say, what questions might you have for me? We've got two minutes left. Have a couple of questions ready that you can ask them. Gene, I have a question for Go you. Go ahead. In this whole, because um, you get a lot of different answers with this. In this whole process, up until you receive a potential job interview, when, in your opinion, do you think it's okay to ask how much the job pays? Uh, honestly, um, wait at least till, till your second interview. Wait at least till the formal interview or your second interview. Um, you should go, uh, go online and search um, Ball State University annual salary survey, all of you. So specific to television, every year Ball State University puts out a, puts out a survey of what people make in every market. Just know that a lot of the, I've found that those salaries are a little bit more inflated than they really are. I think, I think companies puff them up a little bit, but, 
but you know, you're not going to get rich in your first job. Um, and you should do some research to find out which stations in a particular market pay the best. I, it's not always true, but usually in any market you're applying to, if there's three stations in a market, probably two of them will be paying, paying fair wages and one of them will try to get you cheap. And that's usually the last ranked television station. Um, I would not bring up salary in the first chat like this. And I, and I would wait till the end of the formal, uh, a formal interview, which is maybe the next call or when you talk to somebody else on the team. And when you want to ask a question about that, say, look, in the interest of convenience and time for both of us, what's the salary range for this position? Right. And that's floated. Right. And that's where I was getting, getting, you know, getting with this is that, you know, look, I tell students, I'm going to throw out a number here that if you're going into a market that's probably not in the top 100, let's say it's an MMJ, you're probably talking 30 grand a year. You know, uh, it's just a fair number to say. So obviously, if that job in Bismarck, North Dakota comes up, I mean, in, you know, you're not getting more than that. So it shouldn't be a shock to you. Yeah. As you had mentioned, at some point, in all fairness to like not waste each other's time, you know, if you think you're getting 40 or 45 grand and they're only paying you 26 or 27, you know, better to kind of, you know, get that out sooner. I find a lot of students are very intimidated and very afraid to ask that question. And, um, sure. and you know, the thing is, too, especially when I'm approached by, let's say, someone like you that you're looking for someone you know, I'll ask you right away, how much does the job pay? Because it's not in so much in the respect of relaying the information, but just knowing who I think what might want to go for and be willing to settle for that. Yeah. Now, along the lines of that, I might be jumping ahead of your presentation. Oh, no, go ahead. Okay. So um, I always tell people, don't be afraid to negotiate your salary. And it doesn't mean you're going to get what you want or they're going to budge on it. But I, I think students or people who are in their first jobs have to get over that fear. It's like, um, you know, can I get more money? And they're going to go, oh, I can't believe you're asking for more money. Never mind. We're going to find someone else. You know, that they have to understand it's a mutual investment. Yeah. When you hired Amanda P, you know, she's invested in your company and you're invested in her. So um, ask for more um, because the worst they could do is say no. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Here's what I would say when you're applying for jobs, um, especially just coming out of school, never enter a number on the application. Never, it says target salary, never enter a number for target salary because I actually, embarrassingly, I have people applying to me. I, I, this is true, this happened. I had somebody apply to me for a part-time production assistant position and they put $95,000 as their target salary. I laughed and I hit delete. I didn't even, I didn't respond to them. Right? So number one, a rule of negotiation is the first person to name a salary number is the person that loses. Right? So don't put it on your application. Just assume you'd rather get through to the second interview and handle it then, okay? You're not gonna get rich in your first job, I'll just tell you that right now. <laughs> so <laughs> you are not, you're gonna be working for less money than you're worth <laughs> and uh, just treat it as a, a grad school or something. You know, you get paid to go to grad school and learn more. But yeah, don't, don't put it on your application um, and uh, tail end of your second interview, say, look, just so we're both on the same page here, you know, what's the salary range for this position, okay? And then when they tell you, say, okay, um, uh, what, 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 other, what other benefits are there? Do y'all do have benefits? Do you have medical, dental, you know, vision? Um, and, uh, you know, add, get a few other, other things. You know, other companies have other stuff. I mean, you're not, you're not going to get a clothing allowance. You're not going to get a makeup allowance. You're not going to get a hair allowance. All that stuff is ancient history. You're going to get a salary or hourly, depending on the, the rate you're going to get, you're going to, you maybe get a, a tech allowance. I mean, our company offers at our station, a tech allowance we all use our own cell phones to make business calls. So every month we get, we get a few bucks to offset the time we use on our personal phone to make business calls. And so it's salary benefits and a tech allowance. That's it, you know, moving allowance. 
ask for a moving allowance too. What's a moving allowance? Um, so yeah, to totally valid question. Don't do it on this cold call at all. Don't touch it on this cold call. The job of this cold call is really to keep the person on the phone for 90 seconds and make a fa favorable impression. That's the only objective. And also to get a few questions answered because they say, do you have questions? So you want to find out next steps. And that's the last part of the call here. Before you hang up, you need to get these question answered, questions answered. Is it a real opportunity? What's the timetable for filling it? And what is our next step? So you, if they, if they, even if they don't invite you to ask a question, if you've got 30 seconds left in the call to meet your obligation for the, for the, uh, you've, you've done your, your 90 seconds, you've kept your word. It's only a 90 second call. And they say, no, I don't have time to chat with you right now. We like, totally understand that. Um, so, um, before we hang up, just let me, let me ask you one quick question. When, what's your timetable for filling this position? They might say, well, unfortunately, I just got an email this morning from corporate that said my budget's being cut. I'm not going to be able to fill the job. You just take that piece of paper about that job and move it to the back of the binder. It's no longer a real, real opportunity, right? Or they say, well, it's, or it's being delayed until October. You take that and you move it to the back of the binder. It's no longer a real opportunity. It's March right now. You can't wait till October. You need a job in 30 days, right? So you move that back. Or if they said probably in the next 30 days, that's hot. That's a real job. So before you hang up, you want to establish next step. If they invite you to do the quick interview, like we just scenarioed, you've done it. You still say, okay, what I mean, you, 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 you say a couple of things. Number one, um, Ask for the order. See down here at the bottom here, um, you know, you want to establish what's our next step, right? So you say, uh, they say, well, you know, call me back and call me back in two weeks, right? You're like, okay, I'll ring you back. Um, uh, today, today is Wednesday and it's uh, 1030 a.m. your local time. I'll call you back in two weeks from today on at 1030 a.m. Um, and then before you hang up, ask for, thank them and ask for the order. When I say ask for the order, it's you need to clearly state. If at this point in the conversation, you're two minutes into a conversation, you've done your, you've done all your research, you know, and you've had this person on the phone, and you've gotten a quick, little, little litmus test of this person. Were they nice to you? Were they a jerk? Right? You may have started in on your little elevator pitch, and they said, "Can't you read instructions?" The job advertisement said no phone calls, and and you know. Uh, they were really snippy about it. You know, they may have had a bad day. You might want to get, if it's a really great job, you might want to give them a second chance. But if, but if you, if they are totally, a, you know, abusive to you, just draw a big red X through that piece of paper, move it to the back of the binder. You don't want to work for a jerk, right? You've said, okay, you don't get to hire me. And you move on to the next call because you got 99 of them left to make, right? So I would say err on the side of being generous and understanding but what you want to say before you hang up is like, I know we've only chatted for a brief period this morning and I really appreciate your time. I got to tell you, after learning a little bit more about this position and combining that with the research I've already done, I am very excited about this position. I think I'm a great match for it. And given the opportunity, I promise you, I wouldn't let you down. I'll talk to you in two weeks. Thanks a bunch. Hang up. Does that make sense? You've, you've asked for the order. I love this gig. I think I'm a perfect match for you and I cannot wait to continue this conversation. You have a great week and I'll talk to you soon. Boom. You're out of it. You're, you're positive. You're upbeat. You're confident. You've asked for the order. You've planted a positive, positive seed with them. They've had a good experience. You kept your word. I'm going to keep you on the phone for 90 seconds and I'm going to let you get on to your business day. And you, you, you have integrity because you did what you said you were going to do and you've gotten around the robots on the website and you've gathered information. Is it a real job? Is it not a real job? And you know what to do next. Call them in two weeks. Follow with the assistant news director next week on Tuesday, whatever it is they tell you to do, whatever the next step is. So that's a hot lead and it stays near the top of the binder. Does all that make sense? I know I spent a lot of time on that one thing, but if you can get around the website, because I guarantee you a thousand people will apply for that job and four of them will do what I just told you to do. And you'll be one of four that just stand out above a big crowd of nobodies. 
you will move to the, if you handle it correctly, you will move to the top of the list. And sometimes, honestly, it's because it's easy. They like you. You've got good work. Your portfolio is strong. You've just proven you can you can ask for something that I didn't really want to give you, and you got it. So if I send you out on the street to get a story, and somebody tells you no, you're not going to take no for an answer. You're going to keep going after it, and you're checking all the boxes. It's like why would I go plow through a thousand resumes? I just found a person I want to hire. Problem solved. You're hired. Be here in three weeks. Talk to HR. They're going to get you squared away. Let me know if you need anything in the move. I'm going to hook you up with a couple of people that just moved here two weeks ago. They found an apartment. They're going to go give you a list of five or six places to live. Can't wait for you to get here. Follow up if you've got any more questions. I move on to the hundred other problems I got to solve. And you just got yourself a job. I'm being kind of flippant, honestly, guys, you know that. But <laughs> but what I'm saying is if the easier you make it on somebody, the, the more chance you'll get to hire. So what do you do while you're still in school? Content, and if you graduate and still don't have a gig, produce one video story every week, produce one web story every week, try to get paid gigs doing what you want to do. If you can't, keep doing it anyway. Standardize that LinkedIn and platform. Go through that cycle I just talked about. Research, vet, decide whether you would accept it if it was offered, make the calls into the newsroom on off hours to get younger people and people that are not in management that get in trouble for talking. Um, and then do, do, keep doing your follow-ups, keep doing your follow-ups over and over and over again. If you do, if you apply for hundred jobs and you follow up in this manner, you're probably gonna call out 35 of them in the first week and realize those aren't real jobs and you just keep working your way through them. But 45 days from now, if you, if you did this before the end of this week, 45 days from now, you'd have at least two job offers for sure. So that's how you make yourself stand out from the crowd. And I didn't mean, uh, uh, I hope you got at least one nugget uh, that you can take action on. Um, and again, my specific references were about, you know, people trying to get content producer jobs at a local TV station, newspaper or website. But if you, if you take what I've suggested and you just adapt it, you could make this work if you apply for a job at Google or, you know, or IBM or a bank or, you know, a, a nonprofit or any place else. Um, a lot of these things still apply and it gets you around the robots. And it, the, the key is to, to have that, that connection and that touch, you know, in sales, they say it takes at least seven points of contact before you can land a sale, right? And consider getting the job as closing a sale, right? So if you apply on the website, one contact, you send them that first email, second contact, you cold call in, third contact, they invite you to converse two weeks from then, fourth contact, right? Then they hook you up with two of the people in the newsroom who are going to maybe interview you and give you a writing test, two more contacts, right? And then you're in the final round and you have a final interview, seven contacts, and then boom, you get the job. So it adds up pretty quickly. Stay organized, keep the binder. <laughs> so questions. I, I loaded you guys down with a lot of information about uh, managing your job search. Well, what, what specific things might you be dealing with I could help you with? Hey, Gene, um, my name's Laz. I'm a hey, digital Laz. media and communication student. I'm up awesome. here in Washington, DC. Um, I don't really have a question, but more on to reinforce your comments, because um, it's different coming from yourself as a professional or the professors. The professors now have been up here um, um, since January now mm -hmm. um, here in DC. And I want to say that everything you've said is is all factual. And it's and it's effective. Um, I actually this is the second time I hear it from a professional um, in D.C. I met on the bus someone who worked on the Biden transition team uh -huh. and um, she took the time to get to know me and do just like what you did. Sit down with me, um, schedule a Zoom call and a phone call. We were doing introductory calls and she got to know me. We went over my resume. She wow, connected me with other people in her network, um, in her institution. And uh, she works for a really big um, organization up here that um, works with members of Congress and stuff. And um, uh, it's called for Partnership for Public Service. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if you've, you guys have heard of it, but 
um, because of her and um, you taking the time to meet with us, people like yourself, like mentors, um, have been able to shape our resume and work on it uh, and our, on our LinkedIn. So um, I met her once I started getting settled my first month here. I met her in February. I did what she told me. I've applied to 50 places. I've landed eight interviews already. That's a great um, ratio. Dude. I, and I mean, it's been really fortunate. I've interned before at NASA. I got approached once and I've reapplied. Now I've had three interviews in different departments at the agency. Great. Um, uh, Nat Geo, Boeing, and in her um, organization. And I'm, I'm going to keep applying, but I just want to say that um, be an example of doing what you've already said, because I coincidentally met someone similar to your role um, up here in D.C. And D.C. is very competitive because we compete with Ohio, New York, Virginia, Maryland, and D.C., but it's different up here as well. Um, and I always recommend people if they are willing to move like I did to move because people up here are more willing to help you and set aside time. I'm not saying Miami isn't, but it's just different. Okay. Um, people a lot, especially in DC, they've relocated a lot, similar mm -hmm. to my story. So they've been more willing to help out and they understood from the student perspective. But a short um, comment was, I just want to reinforce that everything um, that you've said works, but we have to be, um, as students, I think patient and start from the beginning. It takes a whole semester and then some. So I start hearing back responses in April. A lot of deadlines are closing now, but my goal is even if it's a paid internship so I could stay up here, at least I don't have a gap in my resume. So I just want to share like with my peers and some others that have joined the call that it works. I appreciate, I appreciate you sharing work. that. I'm glad it's working for you. And uh, you know that discipline and that consistency is so important. So I, I applaud you for doing that and being so consistent and, and taking action, you know, taking action and doing it, you know, just doing a little bit every day and you'll win in the end. Yeah, you know, definitely. So yesterday, um, yesterday I had the third interview on NASA and a way to stand out. Um, I did a PowerPoint. I knew they were going to ask about me. So I did a PowerPoint just highlighting what other people have said about me, um, my work, what my portfolio is, um, why I should go um, be offered again a second position on NASA and, um, it, you know, just Milestone, um, milestones or benchmarks and the f the moment I finished it took no more than five minutes I, I I never sent it to them when I scheduled the interview I said hey I'm so glad you asked to find out about me would you have five minutes in this 30 minute window to just um, get to know me I created a par PowerPoint they were completely thrown off they said sure I presented it and the, they said I've never had anyone in an interview do that that's all so I highly recommend in order to stand out to do that and then you just follow up with an email like the next day. Thanks so much for your time. Here was the presentation I um, that I used and it, it worked. It So any way that you guys can be original and do that, it really works any way to stand Laszlo, out. Laszlo, I just have to say, Laszlo has this ability to uh, speak with people with ease. And he also, it's, it's an attitude that I am worthy, I am hopeful. And that attitude says more than, please, could you give me a break? No, it, nobody wants to give you a break. They want to, they want to be happy to have found you. Yep. So you have found yourself. You've done half the job, right? As Jean would say, you're, you're happy about yourself. You're excited. You like them. You, you just need that opportunity to, uh, to let them see it. And it's not, e it's not a, a overblown ego. It's somebody, you know, the happiest thing to do is see somebody who's happy in their job, who likes who they are. Do you like being around somebody who doesn't like who they are? No. So everything Jean is saying, I just love it. And I love your support, Laszlo, your, your you know, reinforcement. Yeah, of course. And it, it was a big mental barrier I had to overcome, especially moving up here. It's very competitive and you can't come in with a mindset, I'm going to make a certain amount or I'm going to it's going to lead to uh, an interview or a job position. Because for example, a lady I met, she had no openings, but she connected me with other people and helped me, you know, work on my um, resources. But also LinkedIn is really powerful right now um, because we're on, um, it sounds super corny or cringy, but um, it, it's the truth. I've been able to find, meet, uh, make connections um, through these people or someone that I know. And then they would know someone and I would say, hey, I see your fault. You have a mutual connection with this person. I'm really interested in following this organization or this person. Could you connect me with them? And um, just striking conversations, and especially from the university, 
that our university has a lot of alums. It's it's all been great. So even if you just have a phone call with them, even if it's a place you want to work for, but they used to work there, it's been helpful. That's great. Good for you. Awesome work. Other, other questions or? Hi, Jean. Yes, I actually do have a question. Great. Um, so my situation is a little different. After graduation, I'm fortunate enough to have already an internship internship lined up. Um, I guess my question for you is in terms of looking for jobs, because the goal, of course, with this internship is to land a job with the company I am working for. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't really know. I know it's not good to assume those things. That's not how it always works out. So how what's your advice in terms of looking for jobs when you're, you know, you're contracted for a temporary amount of time um, in like for after the internship, because I don't know how to really apply for jobs that aren't looking for, that are looking for summer people or are looking for someone quick, but like someone more like later on. So what's your advice on that? Uh, if you don't mind me asking, what what's the gig? What's the internship? So um, I am currently um, in the 4A's multicultural intern advertising program. Uh -huh. um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. It's called MAPE otherwise. So the objective of the program is to match um, college students or recent graduates with advertising agencies across the nation. Awesome. And I've been fortunate enough to be chosen, um, selected by Droga5, a, a top ad agency in New York City. So I am interning for them for about 10 weeks. So it starts in June and in August. So I'm like, I'm hearing my friends say like, oh, I'm applying now, so blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I don't know when to apply or how to apply if I have this thing for this set amount of time. So yes. I, Jean, so that, can, that's, I, can I step in for a quick sure. second before? Okay, Th this advice, um, Christina and Jeanette's heard me say, but I'm gonna tell it to you. Um, number one, the date a lot of times companies say they wanna hire you and when they hire you, like just sometimes just, you know, they just go on and on and on and on. Okay. So that's, that's the first thing. Um, the other thing is what's in front of you is in front of you. So the promise of a job is not a job. And if I tell you how many times students, um, you know, people I know, like, they, they want to apply, a job comes their way, but there's, a, there's something that maybe they perceive as, you know, a big, you know, a bigger prize. They've been told they're going to hire somebody in October, you know, and I'm on the top of their list. Okay. That's a promise. That's mm -hmm. not a job. Okay. The other job that you're applying for is a job, which in front of you is in front of you. So my advice, and then I'll turn it over to Gene, is apply now. Because even, you know, because the greatest thing that could happen to you is that you have a commitment in your internship and they offer you a job. Like, gee, what a rough dilemma that is, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, so I think when you look at it the other way, you're looking at it the wrong way because you're afraid of that happening but how cool would that be to happen? You know, like, wow, I have another month in this internship. I committed and they offered me a job. Hmm, what do I do? And then, you know, you deal with it the way it needs to be dealt with, mm -hmm. but, but the job is there. You know, the promise of them hiring you in your internship now is a promise. It's not there. So you, you apply even in school, you know, I mean, students a lot of times wait to the end, they wait till they graduate to start applying, you know, and they just think that things will work themselves out. It's like, no, you don't know. Amanda Peralta, how, what, Gene, when did she first apply for this job? And then you had to delay it, you know, I mean, yeah, like five, last, six, like last probably, fast fall, late last fall, and then the holidays came up and the person in the, the job then did not leave right away. They stayed through the holidays. So it wasn't until January when they left and the job finally actually opened up. Right. So, you know, that maybe five, six months. And she asked me and she said, I said, Amanda, this is like how it happens all the time. You know, they're not trying to brush you off. It's just how it is. You know, mm -hmm. just sometimes things are, you know, something obviously that's really important to you, like a job, not that it's not important to Gene or someone else. It's just, 
you know, they, they you know, there are other more pressing matters. And you go, well, how can that be? You know, uh, type of a deal. So no, I mean, you should, you all should be applying for jobs. You know, you should have been applying for jobs. And like, I get what a great dilemma, you know, to have to like, oh, what am I going to do? It's better than, oh, I have nothing to do. Mm -hmm. So having said all that, Gene, I'll turn it over. No, that's great. That's great advice. And here's, you know, you're committed to uh, August for this internship Mm -hmm. and great opportunity inside a really great ad firm in the city. Right. So take advantage of everything that brings to you. I mean, knock on wood, but by the time you get to the city, hopefully 90 percent of the people are going to be vaccinated and we're going to be back in business again. Well, unfortunately, I didn't add this. Unfortunately, it is going to be virtual, but Uh, I am planning to visit the city in August with another um, intern just to, you know, scope out, maybe introduce ourselves in person to the agencies and stuff. So, yeah. So. Um, yeah, they're going to be, uh, I would say the, the, the thing about take advantage of what is currently in front of you, as, as Jay said, you have, you've landed a job, it's unpaid, it's an internship, but you've landed an experience, which is going to enable you to make connections in a pretty cool firm and a pretty cool business. So take advantage of that. In the meantime, is there a local ad agency in Miami, you could be doing freelance work for, is there a nonprofit you could be cranking out some work for to improve your portfolio? Um, could you be, could you be um, working with everybody on this Zoom call right now to redesign all the artwork and the aesthetic for all their social media platforms that I just recommended everybody in this class do, right? Have everybody in this class buy you lunch. You'll eat free for two weeks, right? <laughs> <laughs> for redesigning their social media artwork, right? So take advantage of that and make connections. And during the course of that internship, connect with as many people as you can and be transparent with them. It's like, man, I'm so excited to be doing this internship. I'm learning a ton. I'm meeting a ton of cool people. You know, of course, this thing's over in August and I'm going to be looking for a job. What's your advice? Just be transparent with them. You know, how many, how many interns do y'all usually move up? If any, Mm, Okay. what's the forecast for this year? Um, you know, who else do I need to get to know in and around, um, you know, th- this this industry and or the city or, you know, so just be transparent with people and say, I'm you know, first and foremost, they need to understand you're super enthusiastic about the current job or internship you have, and you're going to give it your all and totally crush it while you're there. But go ahead and let them know this, uh, this ends, this ends in August mm-hmm. before this ends. I'm going to be moving into a full-time job somewhere. How do you do it? What do you advise I do? How, so seek out as many contacts and as many mentors as you can and use your social platforms as I recommend our students use their social platforms to publish examples of your work, to be enthusiastic about the experience you're having, you know, because that gets in front of other industry professionals and they might say, well, you know, we didn't do internships because we didn't have the opportunity to do virtual internships, but man, that Patricia's everywhere, man. She's all over social media and she's, that's a cool project. I remember, you know, five years ago when I was a student, I got to work on a project just like that, you know? And so there's a, there's a, there's a, 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 a portfolio of stuff or a, a bunch of different examples there of you being excited about learning, being excited for the opportunity, making the most of it, working hard and being engaged in professional and business related activity and, and, and content. So that, that would be one thing I would say is just understand that it's not just um, doing the assignments they give you. And um, it's about making connections and being, uh, being transparent about it. It's like, it's, it's no secret, you know, you got 10 interns, all of them, you know, want to be in this business. I've been here for a month so far. This, this company is awesome and I want to work here. How do I get a gig in, in August when I graduate? You know, uh, just, just ask them, just be flat out honest with them. What's the strategy I need to, I mean, because right now, every time somebody asks me to do something in this company, I raise my hand, I come in early, I stay late, I put in the extra hour on it. Um, and I've gotten several compliments. What else do I need to be doing in order to crush it here at this company? And if they say, you know, unfortunately, Patricia, I know we're not going to be hiring in August. It's like, then you say, who do you know? Mm. So 
I'm going to kill it for you guys from June to August and prove to you how awesome I am. I'm going to learn, but I'm going to give you your value out of it too. And so at the end of this experience, if y'all don't have something, who you recommend I go to to land a gig over the next couple of months, apply to, begin talking to, so that when I'm when I've completed my commitment to you, I'm moving into something in the industry which is solid and um, you know, um, I'm setting myself up for success to make that transition. Just be transparent and ask for help because honestly, professionals who see young people who are interested, enthusiastic, and work really hard, they will trip over themselves trying to help you. Does that answer your question okay? Yes, it does. Thank you so much to both Absolutely. you and Jay. Thank you so much. Sure. Anybody else got something that's really nagging at them that's kind of bothering them and they're thinking they're worried about it or anxious about it and you're not sure and you, you're, you're, you're confused, you need something cleared up? I mean, I have just a couple questions. So sure. to refer back to what you were talking about, um, and I hope I don't sound naive for asking this question. No, no, probably please. Will. But so when you were talking about um, like avoiding the bots on websites and well, just describing something as not a real job, what exactly do you mean by that? Because I'm oh, sure. not aware. Um, when I say not a real job, I don't mean that there's any kind of nefarious thing going on there that somebody's trying to scam you or fool you. What I mean is that somebody, uh, a reporter at a television station, uh, gets a job and they move up. And so that news director says, oh, great. Um, she calls HR. She says, can you please advertise the reporter position? I need to, you know, Susie's going to leave in three weeks and I need to fill that position. So they advertise the job. It's out there. Applications begin to come in. You see it. You're like, wow, that's cool. You apply for the job. And then a week after it's posted, the general manager has a meeting with the news director and says, look, I'm sorry to, say, to have to ask you to do this, but the first quarter of 2021, we still haven't really recovered. Revenues are really down. I, we can't fill that position until um, May, right? So the news director anticipated being able to fill that in March, and now they're gonna have to wait 60 more days, right? And so you just applied, you don't know that. That's the question you want answered when you when I say real job is, what I mean is, are they actually going to be able to fill it? Have they already filled it? Are they promoting somebody from within or, somebody else in the company. So when I say real job, I just mean, is it a real opportunity for me or has something changed since they advertised it and I applied? Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Sure. Thanks. And um, I have one more question if that's okay. Please. So, um, so I guess like, okay, as far as our resume and what we put on there, I, and I'm not sure how many other people in this class are like me, but I don't have any professional or real experience as far as media goes like all my experience is kind of random just like jobs so um i just what if what if we don't have a lot of media experience the most experience i have is doing things for school pretty much okay so, so uh if you like uh let's say uh, would that be doing something for the school newspaper or for the school television station or something like that would that be what you're what you're talking about something like that well, or no i've i've unfortunately i haven't really done like a lot of extracurricular stuff i'm um, just sort of due to personal reasons but mm -hmm. Yeah, it's mostly just stuff that I've done for classes to gotcha. get my degree. So. so if you don't, it, it, like when people are in school and say they, to, to my, the point I originally made, if they if they don't, if they've never worked for or interned in an actual television station, but they've done it for their school TV operation, then what I recommend they do instead of selling that as a course, which it was a course, you took a practicum and you did a newscast every week or something, sell it as a an experience. So I was an anchor reporter for FIU TV. Format it so it, it, it's not it's not misleading, but you're selling the experience, right? Mm -hmm. So so you're a student reporter, but you're still a reporter, right? So if you don't have things like that, where it's not a professional experience uh, freelancing at a television station or a newspaper or a website or something, and you were not able to participate in 
your uh, student, um, uh, uh, the equivalent on a student level of that stuff, then you might want to take that middle part for the experience part and make that instead of an experience part, make it a skills part. So okay. list the things you can do. You sure. maybe haven't done them in a professional environment or you haven't done them in a student media operation, but you know how to edit, shoot, use Photoshop, you know, maybe you make that middle section. Here's all the things I know how to do and right. all the projects that I've done in relation to that. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That makes me feel better. Thank sure. you. Yeah. One, one other thing about the job thing and um, Jean, you, you, you know, if you could back me on this a little bit, a lot of, um, a lot of students don't understand that when jobs are posted, when you were talking about, are they real jobs? A lot of times jobs are earmarked for specific people, but legally they need to be posted in all industries, not just this industry. So when you apply for a job and you just can't believe that you didn't get a call back or, or whatever the case may be, um, you know, sometimes that's the case. You know, my daughter just, um, she works for NBC Universal. She just got a promotion. I mean, they told her they were gonna hire her, but they had to post the job legally. So people are applying for this job and it's like, like you know, what did I do wrong? And so it, it's just for your introspective, understand you may not have done anything wrong. You just never had a shot to begin with and you never knew it and they're not gonna tell you. And that's just how it is. Um, you know, when Kelly was in here a few weeks ago, I think I told you the story. She was, um, she's a traffic reporter. She was working independently. I mean, you know, as an independent contractor, they wanted to hire her, but they needed to post the job. And people were like calling me and emailing me, did Kelly leave? Should we apply for the job? It's like, no, they, they, they're they gonna hire her, but they have to do it by the book. But do you think I should apply anyway? It's like, you do whatever you, do whatever you want, <laughs> but I'm telling you, they're hiring Kelly. This is right. just how it is. So, you know, um, it's like that a lot of times, you know. So when Gene was telling his story about the reporter that got moved up, I thought maybe Gene, that's where you were going with, with the story. But there's a good chance that someone at that station who might be working part time, they want to hire as that reporter. And um, but they still have to post the job. Yeah. So but just yeah, be so aware. I would yeah, I would concur with you, Jay, that sometimes stations already, you know, you've been working sources and somebody has applied to you and um, you might have somebody in mind. And so you're legally required to post a particular position um, with our company. If we're going to promote someone internally, we don't have to post the job. If we, if it says someone who's already an employee and we're going to promote them, we can just move them up and then post their job. Right. So I've done that a couple of times. Um, but I'll tell you, um, and, and again, and I don't mean to sound I don't mean to sound scary for anybody, but I, I'm i completely transparent with the team members who work with me, right? So, and I'll give you a recent example. Uh, I had a, a person who was a weekend sports anchor and that person wanted to move up in the company and that person was completely capable, just a total rock star. I knew they were gonna get a job, but behind that person was a production staff member who was the unofficial third sports team member. He did his production duties, but he also shot sports. He was on their streaming show weekly uh, every week and did it with him. Uh, I just, uh, just an incredible teammate, an ideal coworker um, and just beloved, you know, probably the, the best loved, you know, employee in the whole building. This is the guy that, you know, probably four years ago was one, the, we, they gave out like three or four awards for the entire company, like employee of the year for the entire company. And this in Jack won one of those awards and got a trip, you know, like four or five people from there. And it, he's a production staff member, right? At a small station in Columbus, but he's just a, a total rock star and a great teammate. So Jack wants to be in sports. So six months before Justin leaves, I tell Jack, I say, Jack, it's no secret. You're already working with sports. You want to be in sports. Um, I, and everybody loves you and is rooting for you. I'm not giving you the job because I like you. You have a shot now at getting that job and you have six months to make me know that you're capable of doing it and that 
you're a slam dunk decision to get that job. And then I told him, here are the six things you need to do to make sure that when Justin leaves, when his contract is up, there's no other decision but to hire you and promote you into that job. And to Jack's credit, Jack got to work and did all of those things. Now, I still advertise the job. And I told Jack, you're going to have to beat out everybody else who comes through that door. But I'm rooting for you. And I know you can if you do these things. He did it. He proved to me that he could do it. So this was before COVID. I can tell you, it is the, it's one of the most fun things I've ever done in my life. I stood in a conference room at a monthly employee, a staff meeting, and I said, thank you, Justin. We're proud of you as you're promoted to our Columbus, Ohio station in a sports job there. And folks, we found the new weekend sports anchor. And then I turned to Jack and I said, Jack Patterson, the room erupted in applause and people began crying and hugging Jack. They were so happy for him. He's killed it. He has absolutely killed it in that position. But my point is, and I, is I was transparent about here's how it's going to work. You have to win the job. It's the same way with any external applicant, right? Um, you're rooting for somebody. You want them to get it, but they've got to deliver. And so you have to deliver. So you shouldn't be surprised and you need to try to make yourself not disappointed when you realize that of the 100 jobs you applied for, 75 of those positions have no interest in you in the end. That's why you apply for 100 jobs. So you can get 25 positions who get excited about you, 10 of them who interview you, five of them who bring you back for second round, and two or three offers out of 100 jobs. That's why you apply for 100 jobs, because the ratio, what, Laz, what was your ratio again? 20 applications? Um, and I applied to 50. Um, eight went on to the final interviews. A few said no, and um, a few of me, they're waiting or haven't heard back. There you go. So that's, that's, a, that's an actual, that's a great ratio. Eight out of 50, that's a pretty good ratio. So, so I, I'm just saying that you don't, if you set yourself up with one kind of an expectation, like I'm going to apply for two jobs and then wait to be called, and they never call you, you're absolutely going to be disappointed. But if you just say, probably most of the people that I apply to and most of the positions for which I apply, they won't even call me back. They don't, they don't, they're, they are not even going to know I exist. If you know that and you just tell yourself that's just the way it is, and it's not really about the 80 people who don't call me, it's about the 20 people that show interest. I have to cast a hundred lines in the water to get 20 solid leads, then it's up to me. I can absolutely crush it through that process, but I then have to remember half of those people are gonna decide, no, you're not a good match. The true opportunity is in that last final 10%. And then you're, you're giving it your all and you'll get a couple of offers from that process. So I second what you say, Jay, and just manage your expectations and don't get down on yourself because of the 80, positions which never circle back with you instead know that's going to happen and just be thankful for it. it's like that's that's 80 jobs you don't have to bother following up on when, when focus I, your energy on the 20. when but, i applied to work at fiu i've been at the school 11 and a half years when i applied i applied for i want to say 25 jobs different jobs you know teaching different things production i got i got one one call back the job i'm in now that was it you know uh, just nothing type of a deal and for all the reasons Gene said, they might not have been real jobs. You know, some some positions, because I was, when I worked at Miami Dade College, uh, besides teaching full-time there, I was also an academic advisor. So some of the academic advisor jobs are just posted year round. You know, it's just a constant post that if they need someone that, oh, okay, we'll start making the calls now. I mean, you don't know that, but as Gene said, you know, is, is it a real job? So some of them were, and, and some of them, all right, you know. Yeah, and so what I would say in 100 jobs, it doesn't mean you and I you only apply for 
if you're a, if you're interested in sports, you only apply for 100 sports jobs because sports jobs are the most competitive jobs with the greatest number of com competitors, the fewest number of opportunities, the lowest turnover rate, and the highest number of applicants. So, you know, I I I, I tell you know students they're in their senior year. And, you know, Alabama has a, has a specific program. Georgia has a specific program for sports journalism. And there are some people who are graduating this May, and they honestly believe they're going to walk out of UGA, and they're going to walk right onto the sideline reporting for ESPN. That is not going to happen. I don't know of a single instance of that ever happening in the history of media, where somebody walked out of a college and went straight to the to SEC nation, to report on the sidelines doesn't mean it couldn't happen but the chances are very very low right so if you're intent on working in sports and i'm just using this as an example you need to apply for all those entry-level jobs at espn all those local sports gigs plus you should be applying for content social media and marketing jobs at every single sports franchise from the new york yankees all the way down to the Lakeland, Florida trash pandas in the in the quadruple A minor league baseball, right? You, you your job is to break in. Your job is not to get the perfect job on day one or job one. It's to break in to your core discipline or something related to your core discipline. And then, but then there's a whole other world of opportunity. The YouTube thing I told you about, social media. And, you know, you're, you're, you want to be a reporter, but you may be able to break into marketing or, or content marketing or, you know, social media management or something like that. So, um, you know, apply to your core discipline, apply to tangential disciplines, and then apply, look for jobs that aren't necessarily, you know, don't have the title you're looking for, but they, they need the skills you have. Strong writer can shoot and edit video is good on the phone with sources, you know, uh, knows how to, uh, uh, understands and knows how to, to uh, maximize social media metrics. There's a ton of jobs out there that have nothing to do with local TV stations that ha have all of those skills listed as a part of the job requirement. So there's a ton of work out there. There's a ton of opportunity out there. And, you know, don't, don't tell yourself, unless I get a sideline reporting job at ESPN, I won't take the job. You might be sitting on the beach for a couple of years, you know, or more. So, but there is opportunity out there. So, you know, if I, you know, one thing I just want you to understand, everybody on this call can get a job. Everybody on this call can get a job. It may not be the perfect job, but it is the starting job. And it's a way to break in and begin your journey. You're you just, just believe in yourself, be kind to yourself apply for a lot of opportunities because you will make your own luck and be open be open if you're sitting there now and saying i'm only going to accept a job if it's in miami miami is a pretty big town you probably could land a job there but if you're willing to extend that to the state of florida and maybe south carolina and georgia you probably quadruple the number of jobs you can contend for you know so expand the pool that you're willing to swim in and the number of opportunities that come your way will also increase exponentially. Anything else on anybody's mind? Any worries? I have a question. Sure. Gene, we spoke, um, I think it was last month. I'm Jeanette, um, yeah. day student in your first capstone. So good to see you. Um, but my question is, I know that when we last spoke, you told me just to apply what you're telling us now. And that's what I've been doing, um, just applying as much as I can and just kind of putting myself out there. Um, and I have gotten some a few interviews, uh, which has been really great. And I just kind of want to know, what do you think it's the best time to kind of follow up after that interview? Um, ask them. You know, okay. I, I'd get them to tell me. You know, okay. so, you know, just uh, like recap that that either a conversation or in person interview or zoom there, whatever it is, you know, recap it as I and I asked you to recap the uh, cold call and, and, and state, you know, so, some specifics. Well, now that we've had a chance to chat more, I'm even more excited about the opportunity in particular. I like this and I like this. And, you know, as we talked about because of that and this skill I have is a good match for this. 
Um, and, and I've also been able to do this other thing that we didn't chat about, but that matches this other thing. So you're restating, you know, what the job is, your research in it, your, your, your match of skills for that particular position. And I'm excited and just say, you know, ask for the order. I'm excited for this process to move forward. What's our next step? Ask them what the next step is, right? And if right. they say, well, um, I'm going to do two weeks of interviews and then I'm going to um, uh, then start, you know, calling people and moving to the second round and, and then just say, okay, well, I'd love to follow back up with you uh, in a couple of weeks. Can I give you a, a, a quick ring, a, another 90 second phone call, you know, a, a week, two weeks from Wednesday, they're probably going to say, yeah, you know, well, great. I'll, I'll call with you, I'll call you right around the same time, two weeks from today. And they just put it on your calendar or send them an outlook invitation for a, for a five minute call and that, and then you know what your next step is, right? Right. And specific to your question though, follow up the very next day, send them a thank you email, recapping the conversation, really enjoyed our conversation and learning about X, Y, and Z, and just restate your ask for the order comments in email form. So there's another touch point in there. And then you, they've told you when to follow up. If they don't, you know, if they haven't given you any indication of when to follow up, then follow up in a week. Okay, perfect. Yeah, a lot of them have been kind of like, well, you know, we'll let you know in a few days. And, you know, sometimes they linger. So yeah. you're kind of wondering when it's a good time to shoot that email. But um, yeah, I think that I think we should, I mean, just to know what's going on. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say I would follow up with an email the very next day, just thanking them for that, that interaction that you just had. Right. Right. And then if they don't give you a specific follow up, well, then if they say in a couple of days, we'll, we'll follow up with you, then just acknowledge, say, you know, hey, sounds great. I'm looking forward to that. Um, you know, I know you guys get busy and there's a ton of stuff. And if something, you know, breaking news happens, you're probably gonna have to back burner that stuff. So if you don't mind, I'll circle back with you next week. You, you establish a follow up timetable. Okay. Right. So if they say we'll get back with you in a couple of couple of days, you say, great, I'll look forward to that. Um, and then just acknowledge, I know you guys get busy. I know some stuff, sometimes stuff blows up and you got breaking news you got to cover that may be delayed. So, you know, if I don't hear from you by the end of this week, I'll circle back with you sometime next week, if that's okay. They're not going to say no. Perfect. They're, they're, you know, then you, then you've told them when you're going to follow up. Right. If they don't tell you, does that help? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Sure. Absolutely. And good to see you again. You too. You too. Keep the faith. Just keep up the process. Thank you. I'm, I'm there. I'm trying. <laughs> Good. Any anybody else out there wrestling with something like that, or uh, looking forward to a goal coming up here or a, a milestone? And Gene, I actually have a favor to ask of you. Your yeah. um, your story. Uh, well, first of all, just um, when I teach the capstone next semester, I'm I'm doing in hybrid. I mean, you know, like one day on, one day off. So I'm going through certification now and I'm totally revamping the course and a lot of, the, you know, I'm kind of using the students this semester to, with some of the new formats. What you said about doing the YouTube channel, I think would be a great idea for my capstone. Um, could you send me either the syllabus or the information, the specifics of um, exactly um, what the requirements those pr that professor was using for their course. Sure, I'll I'll dig through and see if I, I I, I had a uh, at one point I I don't know if I had a syllabus but I had a course meeting schedule with some topics on it. But I'll send you that and I'll send you the contact information. Uh, his name's Chris Robinson. Okay. Um, and uh, Chris used to work for uh, uh, Raycom for many years. Okay. And uh, he has started, launched, and sold a bunch of his own YouTube channels um, uh, just as side projects. And so he's made some money off of YouTube. But, and it's, and again, you, you sit, I, I sat through the entire semester of this one class to see what he was doing after I heard about Jake and these other three people. And I would go in there and just spend, you know, half uh, an hour a week, um, half an hour each time with this class, or, or, or sometimes I get to stay for the whole class. It's not rocket science, man. <laughs> I mean, it, but it's it's but it's it's about demystifying some of that stuff, putting some handles on it, setting some benchmarks. You know, you need to do pu publish your content by a certain time, 
cross-platform market on other social media platforms. But yeah, I'll send you all any information I can dig up from when I was there, I'll send it to you. Okay, because you know, the one thing I learned today in the training is that um, on the days, you know, that since you're only meeting once a week, they want you to have specific tasks that you're you're setting up, not just, well, they're working on their videos or they're writing a script type of a deal. It's just, I guess, you know, for the optics, it looks better this way. And that's a great project. And I'm sure the students, you know, um, so I would just like to see how they, or he set it up. I don't know if Chris sure. is a guy or a gal, but. Uh, it's a guy, yeah. Okay, you know how he set it up because did he have specific content and what his parameters were? Because that'd be a great idea because that way I'd be giving them something to do on the day that we're not teaching the course and they'd be doing something like that. So. Sure, you know. Glenn. Yeah, no, that was folder. awesome. I'll dig through my folder. Christina, I think you had a question. I saw you raise your hand briefly. Yes, um, it kind of segues a little bit different per this conversation, because I know you were talking about how to get a job. Yeah. Um, one, it's great to see you again. You on call. Um, it's more about when you get the job, because everybody's hopeful to get that. I spoke with Amanda a little bit, but she had to run to a story before we could finish our conversation. <laughs> so I'm asking you here, how would you recommend for us to get acclimated? Because there is a big chance that I'm not staying in Miami and I've mm -hmm. come to terms with that on my own. So if I do move to Georgia or Washington or Chicago, wherever it is that I would move, how can I acclimate myself properly so that when it comes time to pitch stories, I have something to pitch because it seems like, do I just go and talk to random people in a grocery store? Do I get buddy buddy with maybe the assignment desk editor, but that's going to fade away. They're not going to really be assigning me stories. So how would I go out and find my own in a place where I don't know? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. You should ask questions. So let, let's assume you're at a point where you've been offered a job. Okay. And you probably want to ask some of these questions before you get offered the job. You want to ask them during the, uh, the interview process. So you'll understand better how that newsroom works. So let's assume you've been offered the job and you're going to be starting there in a month or, you know, so you need to ask them, how do you guys work it? How do you guys work story pitches? How do you handle um, story idea generation? What's your definite news director? What's your definition of success? Because I, I, I'll just use Amanda as an example, right? And what I told Amanda and what I tell every other applicant and every other new person coming in as an MMJ, a reporter and anchor is you may think your job is to perform in a little mini movie every night on television. That's your core responsibility. That's the last 5% of your job. Your success, especially in the early days, is going to be determined by how many original ideas you're bringing to the table and pitching. And we have a system here set up in a way to pre-position you to begin to fill a pipeline with ideas. I'm not expecting you to turn a lead story in the first week you're here. What I'm expecting you to do is to go out in your community or in on your beat, and I'm expecting you your first week to meet 25 people and get 25 business cards from 25 people and be blatant and obvious. Hi, I'm Christina. I'm the new woman in town and I don't know anybody. And people in the newsroom told me you were awesome and amazing and friendly and a real player in this town that I needed to meet. That's why I'm knocking on your door, Mr. Mayor, police chief, sheriff, attorney, elected official, whatever school superintendent, whoever it is. Right. And uh, so I really uh, I, I've looked at your website. I've seen the stories we've done about your school system before. Um, and I'm, you know, in our station, you will, have, you, you're assigned to be, you know, it's usually a geographic area, right? So uh, in Amanda's case, she was connected with the person who was in the job before her and who had already met all those people and had left to become a PR person in the county that she's covering. So Amanda was connected with Donna Williams and was got a brain dump from her. Amanda was also connected with our former morning anchor for the television station, who's the PR person for the city in which Amanda lives in. It's like, go talk to Mercer, get to know her. She knows everybody in that town and she can connect you with everybody you need to connect with, right? And then 
she got a definition of success, which was, you know, I need you working your beats, working your sources. So that over the course of the first 30 to 45 days, first week you come in, you're not going to have a lot of story ideas. Week two, you're going to have a few more. By week three, we're going to need to see some regularity there. And a month into your job, you need to come to the morning meeting with a good story idea every morning. But you, you don't have to do it on day one. Not every newsroom does it like that. So what you want to try to do is get a definition from the news managers, either the news, the news director, assistant news director, assignment manager is like, how do you define success? A new reporter comes into the morning meeting and what happens that you then end the morning meeting and you turn to the next director, the news director and say, wow, you hired a good one. What is your definition of success? If you have the definition, then you can go in search of a methodology to fulfill the definition, right? So specifically before Amanda got here and before other newer members of our staff got here, I sent them an email and I told them some of them a month before they got here, these are the counties and cities you will be covering. I would suggest before you arrive, you learn a little bit about those counties and those cities and the people that are, and I guess some of them I gave names like Amanda, I gave her some names to connect with people before she ever moved here, right? So that's one thing, a couple of things you can do where you can learn about what their definition of success is so that you can meet it. And then you can do some work before you get there. And as soon as you get there to qu as quickly as possible, ramp up and fill your story pipeline, right? Another thing you might be dealing with if you're moving away is you're moving to some place and you may be doing things which you're not used to doing finding an apartment and getting your electricity turned on and the gas turned on and switching over your driver's license to a new place. Well, what we usually do is I connect the new arrival with two or three people in the area who have just gone through six months ago, what they're going through now, but where, where are the places you want to look for an apartment? Where are the cool restaurants? Where's the cool stuff to do? You know, here's a problem you may have not have thought of that you might want to remember, you know, if you're covering like in our, our, our area, if you're covering something in Columbus, it's Eastern time zone. If you're covering something over in Smith Station or Opelika, it's Central time zone. So you don't want to make a mistake and show up an hour early or an hour late for an interview in Alabama if you have to drive. Hard. So little things like that, we try to give them the cheat codes when they get here, you know, so does that help at all in terms of what you're what you're trying to address? Yes, it does because I remember I spoke with her a little bit and she like roughly mentioned about newsletters. She really depended on that in the beginning, but I was like, well, what if there's not much to go off of with the newsletter? Like, who are you talking to? And we had another presentation in Jay's um, capstone class with Daryl Forge as a CNN correspondent. And he was saying that he was reaching out to police chiefs or anything. He would just go get them some coffee or donuts or something and just kind of introduce himself. But I feel like depending on where you go, there may be people who are not as receptive to something like that. So I was never sure if this was something you needed to reach out to your hiring manager to get you in contact with people or how that works. So I was like, she can't just, I mean, LaGrange and Amanda, two separate things in the beginning. So yeah, yeah. I was trying to understand like how she really immersed herself in that kind of culture and ultimately was able to produce the stories that she has. You just need to, you just need to go, you understand that whenever you're moving to an area, um, there's certain things that we always cover. We always cover government. So go to the website, see who the mayor is, see who all the city council members are, who the clerks are, get their names, look at their photos, make yourself a list, um, go to city hall. And when you see somebody that matches that little, you know, thing you have on your phone or that piece of paper, you print it off. It's like Gladys, you know, you don't know me, but I'm Christina. I just moved here. I'm the new reporter, you know, for channel three. You know, and I just, I, I'm actually here today just to say hi to you and some other people. So just want to say, hello, hello, how are you doing? You know? And so, you know, do you have a card? Uh, yeah. And so also look at the published schedules for all the stuff that normally happens in the course of like the city council usually always meets the same time every week. The county commission meets the same time every week, school board, look at all those things and look at the past agendas for the last six months 
for those organizations. And you'll be able to see the issues like the first reading of something, the second reading scheduled for approval. You may be having an issue that's been going on for six months in the first week you're there, it's coming up for a vote. If you will have looked at the agendas and then or looked at the already published material on the station you're going to and the competitors in the newspapers, you can get yourself up to speed on a lot of the issues and know that, oh, okay, well, probably the first month I'm there, there's three big stories gonna happen. You know, one's in the city council, one's on the school board, and one's uh, they're gonna they're gonna probably name a new police chief in Hamilton. You know, the first month I'm there, so I got to be ready for those stories. I'm gonna bulk up on the past stories they've already done about it. So go to the already published stuff, look at the stuff that on the agendas, become familiar with the regular course of business. I know every Tuesday at seven, that city council meets. I'm gonna be there because I know they're all in one place at one time, and I'm gonna meet everybody on the whole city council in in, in a one hour period. You know. So pre-research, definitely define success with your news managers, and then start reaching out to people before you even get there to introduce yourself and say, hey, I'll be there in three weeks. I'm going to be coming by City Hall to say hi to you. I'm going to be coming by the Sheriff's Department to say hi to you. I'm going to be coming by the police station to say hi to you. Just wanted to say hello now to introduce myself and say, I can't wait to get there and begin to uh, tell your stories. Awesome. Thank you so much for the advice. I appreciate sure, it. Sure. Absolutely. Gene, I'm going to officially wrap this up because I know Kate's got to be getting hungry at right. this point. It was a um, it was a pleasure. As, as always, I'm probably going to hit you up again for the summer. And um, I love doing business with you. You know, you're, you're good people. And um, I think yes, I could too. tell by the students that had their camera on that you, you made an impact and you gave them good advice. So I'll end the recording. If you want to stick around a little bit, that's that's your call. I'll stick around a little bit. But uh, thank you again. And guys, thanks for sticking around. We have one more guest speaker scheduled for next week as well, next Tuesday. So and we'll talk about that on Thursday. So thank you all very much. Thank you.